I threw that out on my Instagram a couple of months back. You know, what's the difference between an adventurer or a dealer? Stress and stimulation. You know, and I got a bunch of neuro, oh, stress is cortisol. You know, people want to give me that. I know the neuroscience. The answer is how you filter it completely. You know, how, how do you look at it? Is it happening for you or to you? Are you lucky to be here or, uh, or you're unlucky? I'm in a negotiation a couple of years ago with somebody whose values I detested. And thinking about this person made me angry every time. Is this hostage or business? Business negotiation. But you person, still person was a liar. Person, person lied, had no problem lying. And, uh, that, you know, it, it, I got an ex-girlfriend that once said to me, you'd sooner get your arm torn off than tell me a lie. And I remember thinking at the time, well, the words I find highly complimentary, but the way that you said it makes it sound like an insult. <laughs> like that's, you know, yeah, but wait a minute. You said that like it's a bad thing. So integrity is really important to me. So when I deal with somebody who lacks it, they're going to trigger me. And if they're triggering me negatively, I'm having trouble prepping for the conversation because I'm dumber when I'm angry. And then I remember the only pers- reason this person is persistent in these negotiations is because my company is a success. And in point of fact, I'm lucky to be in this conversation. And as soon as I did that, I reframed it. I was like, I instantly, I found myself in a, in a different frame of mind. So, you know, you, you got to find a phrase Tony Robbins says, I think he's the guy that said, you know, does life happen for you or to you? Life is happening for you. For you. Like, wow, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. You know, however do you reframe that, which takes some practice. Pick, pick out your phrase. Practice it up a little bit because your, your negative circuitry is going to kick in. The, the default circuitry for human beings is negative. Interesting. We inherited from the caveman and the optimistic caveman got eaten by the saber tooth and the negative pessimistic caveman made a run for it or killed it. But the optimistic guy was like, you know, yeah, you know, I, I, got I know, this. I know, I, you know, this, this thing, it, it look, it's not, you know, it just needs How a hug. How hard could it be? <laughs> How hard could it be? <laughs> just needs a hug. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the negative caveman, the, we, we were gifted with the wiring of our ancestors. And the negative guys survived. It's interesting how much you've leveraged an understanding of human nature to get people where you want to go. I want to talk about some of your open-ended questions. I think these are really powerful. So the the way that why questions are accusatory, Mm -hmm. but how questions invite people to do the thinking for you and explain that, like the... Explain the power of how. Yeah, it, well, it, uh, to use common, Kahneman's phraseology, it triggers slow thinking or in-depth thinking. You know, because pe- it's logistical? Uh, yeah. You know, how, how largely is implementation or logistical? Is another, uh, uh, how's this going to get done? Um, it feels deferential. So I'm going to kill these motherfuckers if you don't give me $20 million right now. And you say, how am I supposed to do that? Go to the bank. Call the president. Do whatever you need to do. This is somebody's life. Give me the 20 million right now. How am I supposed to do that right now? You want me to call the president? You want me to go to the bank? Do they not just keep how screaming? Am I supposed to yes, do that right that's now? exactly what I want you to do. All they got to do is come down a little at a time. Now, I'm not resisting. I'm an implementation, and it triggers in-depth thinking. And in point of fact, those are legitimate questions. You know, the, the, ask a question that the, whether the other side likes it or not is actually a legitimate question. Not resisting. I'm asking in a way where I'm deferential. I'm not saying I ain't doing it. I'm asking for your help. Now, how you respond to that is going to tell me where this is really going. You know, there's a 93% success rate means 7% of the time it ain't going to go anywhere. This is nothing but bad. I got to know which one I'm dealing with. 
and some of you know my how and what questions early on, and occasional the the strategical use of why, surgical use of why, I got to diagnose what I'm really dealing with, and I got to do it in a way where you're not feeling like you're being diagnosed. But you know, because I, I got to do everything I can do to avoid triggering you. But I got, I got, I got to get a diagnostic on what I'm actually dealing with to begin with. And how do you handle telling people no in a way that doesn't shut them down? Yeah, you know, uh, a friend of mine here in town, Ned Coletti, used to be the GM for the Dodgers. Brilliant negotiator, good guy, like him a lot. Ned is still around. I'm still affiliated with the Dodgers. First year he was uh, GM, they went from worst to first. That's a sign of a capable GM. Okay. You know, and, and we were talking about this one time, and Ned said that someone had taught him to let out no a little at a time. And I'm like, that's exactly what we're doing. Like, you have to be able to say no to people. What your job is to not let them get blindsided by it, where they feel like they were clotheslined and caught off guard. So you let it out a little at a time. And how am I supposed to do that is really a way to get the other side thinking about the difficulty of the situation, about the difficulty of the ask. And it's the first way to start Why letting know out. you just say that's really going to be hard? Further down the line, we're going to get there. But first, I really kind of need the how question is designed to get stop you in your, tra- your tracks and get you thinking. It's calibrated, which is why we call them calibrated questions to start to trigger a state change in the other side now we got to let out a little more no and a little from away as we go along then we got we, we got a whole succession of ways to eventually ultimately if forced into it to say no which then also is not no it's no but we don't need to go like if if you hear no from me or my side We've been hinting at it for a while. So you're not going to be cl- feel blindsided by it. You, you're gonna, yeah, and we're going to continue to demonstrate collaboration. Because, you know, I don't want to go all the way to know. If we're talking, there's a reason for us to talk. The adversary is the situation. So if there's a reason for us to collaborate and talk, well, we can both be better off. I also don't want to let out no too quickly because there might be a better way, and I want to discover that. So let's let me let me let me start telegraphing that there are problems here, inviting collaboration. See if we can tease out a solution before the thing goes down the tubes. Have you ever had a negotiator or a um, hostage taker give you an answer to something that you were like, I actually don't have a rebuttal to that. We should try that. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, I was. I, I'm running these scenarios through my head, and I'm like, what would I do if they like offered a suggestion? I'm like, yeah, like actually sounds. Maybe we should try that. <laughs> like, how do you, because there are scenarios where you end up pay- paying, apparently, $20 million. Well, we, well, first of all, it wasn't a U.S. that paid that or anybody on the U.S. side. So the U.S. would never do that? Uh, correct. U- the U.S. does not pay ransom. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be bait money go downrange. Meaning because you give them money that you know you're going to take back? Or you're going to trace. Like, like money is ridiculously easy to trace, like ridiculously easy. And it could be a very smart move. It's like eject, injecting dye into their financial circulatory system. Mm. Where are they buying weapons? Who are they paying safe houses for? They got a larger criminal network. Terrorists are not supported by the Red Cross. They're oh. supported by a larger criminal network of illegal arms dealers and illegal this and illegal that. And you want to know who they're buying their guns from. And the best way to find out who they're buying their guns from is to give them some money that you could trace and find out where it goes. Follow the money, as they said a long time ago in in the Watergate scandal. That's a tremendous investigative tool. And if you, there was uh, in 2000, that was exactly what happened because there was a criminal gang out of Ecuador that had been taking hostages on oil platforms every year about October. And they were a combination of former terrorists and criminals. And so the third time it went down, a payment was made 
because they, if they had assaulted the, the oil platform, they'd only got the kidnappers, who were the low end of the food chain. But they made a payment, and they ended up dismantling the gang in its entirety, and they never hit again. Oh. Over 50 people were rounded up. Because they were tracking the money. Tracking the money. The whole organization was dismantled as a result of the ransom payment. So it became a great way to take out a criminal organization that had been operating completely freely prior to that. And a rescue would have only taken out the bad guys on a platform. It would not have taken out the whole organization. They took the whole thing down, and these guys never resurfaced as an organization again. So going back to the magic words that you use as a negotiator, why is getting them to say no more important or better, much better, if I remember your words correctly, yeah. than yes? Yeah, it's, it's shocking. Um, and a friend of mine that I'm flattered that we're acquainted, Andrew Huberman, Huberman Labs podcast. I know him well. Amazing guy. Brilliant neuroscience stuff. Uh, met him for the first time recently. We're sitting down at lunch, and I'm like, all right, so I don't know what the neuroscience behind this is, but people feel safe and protected when they say no. They feel better. They're more likely to collaborate. And then plus we that's know- so weird. What, the other thing that's crazy that we know for sure is, like when you're exhausted mentally, you could still say no. Mm. But yes is hard. Yes is hard, or even ask, answering how. Like if, if, you, uh, if, if you're tired, and one of my colleagues did this to me recently, and I could instantly tell the difference. They wanted to follow up with me when I was exhausted, and I knew that if they'd asked me, what are you thinking, what, great question, triggered deep thinking, I didn't have the mental gas in the tank to answer that question. But they answered me a question that was built around no, and I went boom, 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 boom. I laid it all out. And I was like, wow. I don't, I don't know how that happens. <laughs> I just know it does. And we've seen time after time, if I need to close a deal at all, especially if I know that you're tired, instead of saying, do you agree? Do you want to do this? Are you in favor of this? I say, do you disagree? Is this a bad idea? Are you against this? Is this ridiculous? And you'll either go, no, let's do it. Or you go, no, but here are the problems. And you'll lay them all out for me. And feel no obligation which means you're going to lay them out to me honestly. Like if I say, do you agree with this? You're going to afraid to say yes, but here are the problems because you feel that yes is an obligation. And you're going to be worried about digging yourself deeper in by saying anything after that. But having said no, you feel you have no obligation. I think it might be that simple. So you will, you will lay the rest of the stuff out, not being worried about digging yourself into a hole. It's really interesting that some part of our brain is tracking the, even though it's not like obviously a contract, but that some part of our brain is like, yeah, we've just agreed to that. And now I have a sense of obligation and they have the right to like, take me to task on it. It's right. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And we stumbled over that one by, by accident. And it is just the, the good and the bad about getting people to say no is it makes such a huge difference in all interactions that sometimes that's the only thing somebody learns. And we're like, look, there is so much more here. Like, I know you're making a lot more money now. And you're doing better than anybody that you see around you. But you're not doing as good as you could be doing, and you cannot stop there. A lot of people, I see it all the time. They just learn how to trigger no instead of yes, and they're instantly, significantly more successful. And they quit there. They don't keep going. All right. What then, if you were going to bring this all together, if no is that first bit that shows people like, whoa, you can frame this in a new way, what are the, the few key tenets of like, all right, if you had to bestow quickly upon somebody what the core tenets of the black swan way are. Yeah, let, you know, let the other side go first. Um, and then you know, the cliche, the other side's got to talk five times as much as you. Not twice as much, five times as much. It doesn't mean that you go, uh, that you go mute. You drop in occasionally you let the other person know that whatever they're thinking is, it's okay to share it. Like, 
one of our favorite things, you got to have some go-to labels. Go-to labels? Yeah, label is one of our negotiation techniques. Seems like, sounds like, looks like, feels like. No matter what anybody says, you can say, seems like you had a reason for saying that. Like, no matter what they say, I hate you and everything you stand for. Seems like you got a reason for saying that. It's disarming. They'll talk with you about it. I want to do business with you, and I want to deal with you right now. Seems like I had a reason for saying that. Well, yeah, here's why I want to do business with you. Um, one, one of my son came up with, again, like, bring a guy. We, you know, we would not be our team without him. Clients call on a phone. Say, how are you today? How are you today is a diagnostic. They want to know if they could talk, if you're in a mood to talk about what they want to talk about. Brandon's response is, seems like you got something on your mind. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, because they've been, they've been planning this call. How are you today is not like genuinely how some people really want to know, but most people want to know, are you prepared to listen to what I have on my right. mind? How are you as a temperature check? Are you in a bad mood? Because I'm wasting my time. Are you in a good right. mood? We could talk. And the, the only pushback he ever got on that was he had a guy say, yeah, you know, there's stuff I want to talk about. Really, I want to know how we are today. And so Brandon said, yeah, I'm good, you know, we talked about it, and then they got down to business. So, you know, it, the more you encourage the other side to talk, the more likely it is that you're going to get to this moment of collaboration quicker. Never be so sure of what you want that you wouldn't take something better. How do you get something better? You get the other side to talk. You spend a lot less time talking and appreciate that they're bringing something to the table that you could use. The black swan, the tiny little thing that's going to change everything. You trigger that, you're going to make great deals. And that's it. That's We've it. got our, our basic principles. Uh, Chris, it was great hey, meeting Charles, you. How are you? I'm well, thank you. It was great meeting you the other week, and I loved your story about meeting Jack Welch and uh, asking him to come speak at your uh, class, I believe was it was at SC, um, by framing yeah. it in a no question. I want you to know I've been using that with my girlfriend. I've been using the would it be ridiculous or would I be out of line if I asked for this? And I wanted to know if you had any other good no questions to ask that are really yes questions. You know, I don't, I, I don't, all of them. I mean, I don't ask any yes questions. Uh, I, ju I just know that people, it works better. It hits the brain better. So, you know, uh, is now a bad time to talk? Um, is it a ridiculous idea? Have you given up on? Um, is it a bad idea? Are you opposed? Do you disagree? I mean, with, with the slightest amount of practice, you could switch any yes question into a no question and it, it just works it works better across the board. I mean we don't nobody in my company asks yes questions. Nobody nobody asks, uh, have you got a few minutes to talk? Nobody says do do you agree? It just across the board it makes it safer for people to answer. And also the real issue always is if there are problems, I want you to feel free to tell me what the problems are. And you're gonna feel free to tell me those problems after no. So with just a little bit of practice, uh, and it takes practice. You know, all of these are, are you know, get your practice reps in in the low-stakes conversations. And pretty soon the stuff starts starts flowing out of your mouth. I'm, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm, I'm, in a, uh, I'm making a pitch in a hotel for a room upgrade, and I don't got any room upgrades. But I've worked so much on no-oriented questions, and because, like, I am pushing this guy hard for something extra that I'm not paying for. And finally, he, I says, well, is it ridiculous for you to make it up for me at the bar? And he's like, he's like, no, no. And he goes and gets a bunch of free trick drink coupons for the bar. So, you know, no oriented questions is a great one to practice. You'll find it'll bail you out when you're trying to get free drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Thanks. Why do we use the no-oriented question? We use the no-oriented question because it protects the autonomy of the other side. People know when you're driving them for a yes, and most of the time they resent it. 
the people on the globe are, yes, addicted and, yes, battered at the same time. We're seduced by, yes, when we hear it, we get all giddy inside. And um, when it's used against us, we resent it because it, we feel like our ability to say no has been encroached upon. But they're very effective at breaking them past, helping people to think clearly or getting them to respond to you when they've dropped off the face of the earth. Uh, some examples of no oriented questions appear on the right side of the screen. And these are all alternatives to the yes oriented questions that are on the left side of the screen. Would it be ridiculous? Is it out of the question? Am I out of line? Would it be off putting? Have you given up on? Are you against is also one that I like to use quite frequently. Are you against X? Chris, did you have something or are you spazzing? What happened to my favorite no answered question? Which is? Is it be ridiculous? Oh, is it be ridiculous? Yeah, we got rid of that. <laughs> Once we got you through grammar school, we felt it was no longer necessary to keep that up. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's any any question where you're driving for. Yes, a little bit of mental power can be changed to a no oriented question. And I am continually amazed at what people will agree to by saying the word no that they would never agree to or say or say yes to. And, and this is not a heckle, but it's one more I want to throw because this is particularly in, in dealing with the bosses. Guys, we have counseled people to say to a boss, do you want me to fail? And it has broken impasse and uncovered answers and reoriented the negotiations. And no oriented questions originally started, the first trigger point on this came from a woman negotiating with her boss. And she ultimately completely got her way by starting with a no oriented question. So understand, do you want me to fail? Do you want this to fail? is a legitimate question to a boss who has given you an impossible task. The bad news if they've given you an impossible task, it's an impossible task in point of fact. The good news if they've given you an impossible task, they think a lot of you and they are looking for you to save the day. So no oriented questions with the bosses are very effective things. For sure. Good ad. So Essentially, what you're going to do when you're doing no oriented questions is you're going to make no work for you. Okay, you're going to get them to give you a yes, but they're actually going to be able to say no. Yes, when you're when you're going for a yes from somebody and you're constantly trying to get them to say yes, you're taking away their autonomy. And when someone says yes, sometimes it seems like a trap to them. It also seems like no matter what the question is, if they say yes, it's some kind of a commitment that they might not be ready to get into. So instead, ask them a question that they can answer no to, but it actually means yes to you because saying no makes people feel protected, makes them feel safe, makes them feel like they still have all their cards hidden and they just feel better about it. So if you put that question um, in a way that allows them to be negative, it works out better for you. Also, when you're constantly asking questions that you want a yes answer to, you look like that demanding mother who says, did you clean your room? Did you do the dishes? Did you do this? Did you, did you make your bed? Because, you know, everyone heard that from mom growing up, right? Yeah, and you're like, yes, 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 yes. And it's just like so annoying. So no one wants to be equated to the demanding mom. So instead, you can say, would it be impossible for you to make a copy of this for me? And they're going to want to say no, because maybe they don't want to make the copy. I don't know, but they're going to say no. But is it going to mean no? It's going to, no, it's going to mean yes to you because of the way you phrase the question. So it's really kind of magical how this works. Um, essentially, you are demonstrating concern for what this ask, what the impact that ask is going to have on that person. Because, you know, when you're asking someone to go run an errand for you, oh, would it be impossible for you to run to the store and get this for me? Okay, you're, you're saying, yeah, by my tone of voice, I'm letting you know that I know this is, might be inconvenient for you, but would it be impossible for you to just do this for me? Proper tone is important. Um, Davey, take the next one. Sets of the powerful feeling of graciousness. You're better at this one than I am. Uh, yeah. 
So um, because you can use the, I mean, there are a few phrases that are really go-to for an oriented questions. So would it be impossible to, would it be ridiculous? Would it be um, out of the question? Like those are three really good go-tos. Um, if you want to make it a little bit more specific, so for example, like um, say that you have to move a meeting, like this happens to me a lot, right? Um, then you say, would it throw off your whole, like, I know you're already busy, would it throw off your whole schedule if we move this meeting? So it's, it's almost this opportunity, again, to express understanding, to express like, hey, I know you're busy, this might throw everything off. So you can even phrase the question in that way, right? Or something I really like to do is, would it be really difficult to, or would it be bothersome to? So like you can use whatever you think like, well, they might feel like this is annoying or they might feel like um, this is going to be really problematic for them. And so then you say that in the in that no oriented question. It's almost like a way that you can kind of address whatever it is that they're going to feel within the no oriented question, essentially. So it makes it feel kind of gracious because you've thought about this. You've thought about how is this going to impact you? Instead of just making an ask and making sure they do it, you're thinking about, okay, this is going to impact this person in, in this way. Mm -hmm. And you express that, and then they're even more likely to want to do what you're asking, essentially. It also, depending on the kind of question that you're asking, and some of the things that Davy was just saying kind of fall under this, makes the other side feel like the decision to do the action was theirs. So if you, and you can double whammy them with an accusations audit, um, yeah, you may think I'm, I'm being so irresponsible with my time and my schedule. Would it be impossible or would it put you in a bad position if we could move the meeting to three o'clock? And then they're going to say, oh, no, no, it's okay. We, we can move the meeting. It's going to feel like the decision was theirs because you, you basically asked that question <clears throat> in a way that it feels like they can decide whether or not they can make the movement. But because it was kind of geared at a no a question, it makes them feel like they were nice enough to take that action for you and it was their decision. Yeah, okay, like so the ball was in their court, they're doing this for you. Yes. And it, it, it lets is, them feel like they're being nice. Exactly, and that is huge when you're talking about um, where you stand psychologically with somebody because the more you make somebody feel like they are in control, the better they feel even when they're not in control, because you know you're asking the questions in such a way that you are literally in control, but you're letting them feel like they have the control. Um, so that, that does do something for people in their brains. So it's just something to really keep, you know, in the forefront of your mind when you're about to ask someone a yes question that you want a yes to, take two seconds to frame it so that they can say no, but still mean yes to you. Yeah, exactly. Then they feel like they're the ones that are that they're maintaining power, essentially. Yes, because no is a powerful thing to be able to say to someone. I didn't feel comfortable using the calibrated questions and saying, how am I supposed to do that? So I changed it a little in a way I felt more comfortable. And I would say, like, that's going to be really difficult. And we're going to have to try to think of a creative solution. And then that kind of trying to imply how am I supposed to do that? Um, and I mean, they talk after it and, and give suggestions. So I, I think it's working. It is working. And, and here's, here's the difference between what you did and how am I supposed to do that? First of all, how am I supposed to do that is a phase of no. That is an assertive move. So you want to hold on to that for later in the conversation or the relationship when it's more appropriate. But the way you set it up means that you are, you're priming them for it. You're lowering the expectation so that if it does become a, how am I supposed to do that? It's not going to be a shock to the system because you've already set them up. So I, I love the way you're playing around with it. Now you're starting to make this stuff your own which is the ultimate goal is to take these skills and make them a part of your repertoire. You say and do things differently than the way that I say and do things. Troy says them in a way that uh, it's different for me as well. Everybody's got their own spin on the black swan method. 
Yeah, I, I've seen the ability to take someone off their guard and to have them really disarmed and having an open discussion. And then the slightest little thing can throw that back up. And it's not necessarily something where I say something really difficult to you. Just the slight trigger can bring it back up. And I've been listening to other meetings we have with other people at my office that host those meetings. And they have someone completely disarmed. And then they say something like, hey, I've been in the business a long time too, implying you're not the only one that knows this shit. Right. And then when that happens, like, you had them for like an hour. They were just stringing along saying, yeah, I could see that. I understand that. And then you threw that in. You just worked backwards. So I'm trying to use the ways to keep them disarmed as long as possible. And then when I have to get serious, you drop the tone and say, that is something that will have to remain. And then they know like that it's, they're not going to get movement on there because I've only said that with that voice twice out of 50 other times, you know? Yeah. Um, but I've seen people arm up so quick. So I'm trying to be aware of, you can get everything right 90% of the time. And that 10% can completely burn you for all that work you put in. Yeah. If, 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 like, yeah, if you're not, if you're not careful, that can happen. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to drop the bomb on somebody at some point you're going to have to draw your line in the sand and so when you're switching into that late night fmdj voice to convey your assertiveness remember that that's assertiveness is the precursor to that should be something from the tactical empathy side of the ledger as well as the accusations audit side of the side of the ledger so you know i i'm sorry i ran it up the flagpole nobody saluted we just can't do that. I'm sorry. I ran it up the flagpole. Nobody saluted. This is going to catch you off guard. This is going to be disappointing to hear. It's going to feel like I punched you in the stomach. We just can't do that. Vaughn, what do you got? A similar kind of a, how am I supposed to do that question? We've been negotiating with the customer for about three or four months. It's a customer we really do not want to work with, but at the price, we would be willing to do so. Uh, so we've been going back and forth and back and forth with them, uh, raised our, party, our prices quite a bit. And then they started uh, to do something very interesting, so picking apart our proposal uh, kind of a la carte. Uh, and that was going over about a two week span uh, until I went in and I just said, you know, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to let you pick apart my proposal like that? And they went completely dark for two days. And then Friday, they said, you know what, we're going to go ahead and sign the proposal. So I, I don't know what the two days was. I don't know why it did that. I don't, I don't know what prompted that. But it really made them make a decision because we all, all I said was my email was just, how am I supposed to do that? And I just let them stew for two days. And they came back with a signed proposal. That's one of the purposes behind why or how am I supposed to do that or the other phases of no is for them to go back and start to bargain with themselves so that you don't have to. Yeah. It's a thought shaping question. You're shaping their thought. You're engaging the, the, the uh, problem solving or the critical thinking portion of their brain. And so that's perfect. Let them go back and stew for two days. You haven't told them no, and you haven't offered any other solutions. You have in essence told them you go back and figure it out, which is what they did. Nicely done. Jack Welch, author of Jack and Winning, alongside his, with his wife, Susie. They're coming through uh, Los Angeles a couple of years ago. They're, they're, they're hustling their book, The Real Life MBA. I go to the book signing Jack Welch is at. I want him to come speak to the negotiation course I'm teaching at the time at USC. How many people try to get Jack Welch to say yes to something at that book signing? Pretty much every one of them, right? They're gonna come up there, Jack, how are you? My, yeah, my kid makes, my wife makes a great meatloaf. You wanna come to the house tonight? God knows what they're gonna ask him. Jack, I got this invention, would you pose with it? How many people are gonna ask him to try to say yes? That day, that week, how many people try to get Jack Welch to say yes to something? You're me, you come up to Jack Welch, what do you say? And how much time do you have? 
you maybe got seven seconds. And even if you get to the second response after him, there's 300 people standing behind you in line. They walk you up there. Before you get to them, they say, what's your name? Chris, write it on a piece of paper so Jack doesn't get it wrong. Really, that's so you don't, so you don't talk to him. And then you keep moving. On top of that, have they patted me down? Do they know whether or not I've got a gun? Have I been through a metal detector? As a matter of fact, I do have a gun, but he's not in trouble for me. They don't have my identification. They don't know I'm not going to hurt him. I'm going to get within arm's length of Jack Welch. Action is quicker than reaction. They can't stop me from doing anything I want to do. This is, this is the dilemma of bodyguards. You get within arm's length of the target, you can only stop them after they've done it. You can grab them after they've killed your target. But you can't stop them. I'm, I'm going to get within arm's length of Jack Welch. They, I could do whatever I want. I could walk up to him and kiss him right on the lips if I want to, right? <laughs> he was falling asleep. I want to make sure he's wake up. <laughs> he's he's going to wake up screaming in the middle of the night time. Ah! <laughs> I walk up to Jack Welch, and this is what I say to him. Is it a ridiculous idea for you to come and speak at the negotiation course that I teach at USC. He looks up and to the left, he gets this really intense scowl on his face. And he just freezes. And I think to myself, I just killed Jack Welch. <laughs> he had a stroke, he's so furious, and he's gonna die, and the security's gonna tackle me, and gonna drag me on cuffs. And I'm gonna say, but I'm an FBI agent. Said, we don't care, he killed Jack Welch. So initially, when he doesn't die, I'm relieved, but he still doesn't move. But finally, he unfreezes, and he looks at me, and he says, it's my personal assistant's name. This is a special Twitter account we have set up to co communicate with her. I will call her and tell her who you are and what you want. I think we're going to be in Los Angeles in the fall. If we are, we'll come in and speak at your class. A calibrated no is worth at least five yeses. Amazing. Rahul. What's up? What's your question? Yeah, Nicole, uh, th thanks so much for having me on stage. Uh, and Chris, I'm a huge fan of you, and uh, I read your book, uh, Never Split the Difference of Negotiating as if your life depend on it. So I really love that book, and so I want to give thanks, a huge shout out. Yeah, you're welcome. And I want to give a huge shout out to everyone on stage and the, in the audience. And um, yeah, my question is, um, it's about uh, saying no. So actually, I, I read one of your blogs, um, communication skills, the three ways to make no for you. Uh, so what, what would be the best piece of advice you would give someone like me who finds it hard to say no sometimes? And how can I build my confidence by saying no during the right time? So, yeah, that's that's my question. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, great question. I mean, that kind of like, so like any word, there's two two aspects. You know, if you're saying it and if you're hearing it. But in, in every negotiator's life, there's a turning point. The biggest turning point is probably coming to grips with the words yes and no. And I, I, a thousand percent, I, rem I remember the moment. It's about 2002. I'm walking to an airport, and I'm always looking at the books shelves, and I see a book on a bookshelf that says start with no. And I literally do a double take. Stop me in my tracks. Like start with no in the business negotiating section. This is nuts. I got to look at this book. And it was Jim Camp's book on and he wasn't really trying to get people to say no, but it was about you being okay with hearing it. And then you being okay with letting the other side know it's cool to say no. And his whole approach, he called it the right to veto. He said at the beginning of the negotiation, say to the other side, it's okay, you can say no to me at any time. Say no, and this is over. You're free to say no whenever. And then Camp writes in his book that people will die to preserve their autonomy and when you take away their right to say no you take away their autonomy and they'll die to preserve it and i remember thinking like no shit we learned that in hostage negotiation a long time ago that's why we got hostage negotiators because people are getting killed right and left over losing their autonomy over their home so coming to grips with yes or no will move you forward as a communicator now, hearing it and saying it, uh, it I'm, my buddy in L.A., Ned Coletti, former GM of the Dodgers, great guy, good human being. I borrow this phrase from him. He, he said, I like to let out no a little at a time. Don't let the other side be shocked with the word no. You know, how can you 
begin to hint that there's a no coming if they don't watch it. You know, we start that out. I start that out in the book. I wrote the book, Never Split the Difference, with my son, Brandon, and Tal Raz. Brandon is uncredited co-author. We start with the number one way to let out no a little at a time, which is how am I supposed to do that? The other side's reaction gives you a clear picture of who you're dealing with and how collaborative they're going to be. You're not saying that to get an answer from them. You're saying that to begin to warn them that no is on its way. I never want anybody to be shocked when I flat out say no. I'll start out by saying, how am I supposed to do that? One time in 10, they're going to come back and say, that's up to you to figure out if you want the deal. You got to do it my way. One time in 10. When that one time in 10 comes, my answer is, I'm sorry. You've been very generous. That just doesn't work for me. That's a little stronger way to say no. That hits a couple of more emotional levers from the other side. If I say, if, if a black swan says to you, I'm sorry, there's bad news on the way and we are warning you. <laughs> We never let you get hit with bad news and then say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry is our precursor to us taking a stronger position and giving you a chance to brace yourself for hearing a tougher drawing of a line, you know, a stronger boundary. I don't want you to, to run into the boundary and be shocked by it. I'm going to warn you it's coming after I've warned you a couple times. If I need to say no, then I'm going to say no. And then I'm going to say, I look forward to the day when we work this out because my intention from the beginning was for us to have a great long-term relationship. And when we're prepared to make mutually beneficial commitments, we can continue this conversation. And then it's peace out from my side. Now, no from the other side. You feel safe when you say no. You feel protected. If you feel safe and protected, you're more likely to collaborate with me freely because you feel safe and protected. So I'm going to say what we were talking about before earlier with Brian. Have you given up on whatever it is? Do you disagree? Are you against? Is this a ridiculous idea? If I'm worried that you might react negatively, I just opened a very emotional negotiation tonight within my family on some very emotional issues in reference to my mother's recent passing. And I don't want anybody to feel like I'm intruding on their feelings or their autonomy. So I started out with, are you opposed to me wanting this? Because I want to know if they're opposed and I want, to, I want them to not feel guilty over their emotional feelings. So the best way for me to start that out is to start it out in, in that fashion. And that negotiation, which is meant to be collaborative in nature with nobody losing, has started out well. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks so much for that answer. And um, yeah, I'd love to if, see if... Uh, you'd be interested in coming maybe on one of my clubs, love to interview him. But. One of the biggest surprises that I took really to heart in the book was getting to know yeah. first. Where we're so wired, I mean, we're completely wired for the opposite. For example, on a recruiting call, if I call a typical agent, you know, who doesn't know who I am, I may say, hey, you know, Chris, this is Alex Vidal with Related ISG, blah, blah, blah. How are you doing today? By the way, I see you're a great agent. I was calling to see if you would be interested in learning more about my company. And the typical answer is, no, I'm happy where I'm at. It's a 30-second call. Right. I read your book. I sit down with my leadership team. And I say, guys, I want to try something different. Just, ha just hang out. I'm going to put it on speaker. So I call Chris. And now Chris answers the phone. And I say, hey, Chris, this is Alex Vidal with Related as International Realty. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm like, oh, man, I'm doing great. I already know you're a great agent. Just the fact that you even picked up your phone to begin with. They start laughing, you know, because in realtors in South Florida never answer their phone. So then I follow it up. Go, let me ask you a question. Do you want to make less money this year than you did last year? And they say, no. 
And I'm like, no, no, of course not. Of course I want to make more money this year than I did last year. Oh, it sounds like you want to make this your best year ever. I do. Well, that's why I was calling. I want to show you how my brokerage can help make that happen for you. And I got the no right away. And then you got the no out of the way. And then I followed it up with, you know, the, the mirroring and the labeling and all that. And it was very interesting. My average recruiting call went from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. Wow. And just using that opening line, and I don't care, I'll share it with my competitors. I, I really, it doesn't really bother me. They were just spewing out information, literally using the mirroring and the labeling. What is it about people's need to want to say no? And what are the benefits of getting that no out of the way first? Yeah, you know, um, we're conditioned. There's some conditioning out there that, that we got to recognize. It's just true. So we've gotten conditioned that every time we say yes, somebody's trying to lead us into a trap. Somebody's trying to get us to say yes. You know, the uh, momentum selling says each yes is a tie down. A tie down takes away our autonomy, a basic human driver of what we are as human beings. Not what we are as males or females, not what we are as Westerners, as human beings. And this is about human wiring. You can't point to a, a civilization in the history of mankind that was content as slaves. It's driven us since we crawled out of the swamps. So these tie downs take away our autonomy and immediately begin to diminish rapport as we take away somebody's autonomy. And so we begin condition that if somebody's trying to get us to say yes, we're under attack. We've also conditioned ourselves is when we say no, we've just protected ourselves. We've just done something to preserve our autonomy. We're safer. Mm -hmm. Every time we say no, which is why so many people's default answer is no, not because they thought it through, but they've conditioned themselves, which means they feel safe when they say no. That is a neurochemical response. Sure. The chemicals that you feel when you say no make you feel safe and secure. Consequently, you're more willing to listen. Your guard's not up. You've protected yourself. So you start out with that question right away where somebody says no, then they just got a hit of all the chemicals that make them feel safe. And now they're willing to talk to you. And then you've got, a, you've got a, your, uh, your follow on moves are all designed to make them feel heard. Like you're interacting with them instead of against them. I mean, it sounds like you like to make more money. That was based on their response you instantly prepare yourself to go into a collaborative conversation. Again, they're not threatened. They're not being attacked. They're not under siege. And now it's, it's, I'm not the least bit surprised that you're going from 30-second calls to 10-minute calls because as soon as you preserve the other side's autonomy, now they can talk to you candidly. Plus, you're different than all the other bozos out there that are trying to get them to say yes. That's it. And, and you know, the, the, the typical answer is, well, I'm happy where I'm at. Oh, it sounds like they take really good care of you. Yeah, they do. Awesome. What is it that they, they take, you know, maybe I can learn something about, I can do in my company. What is it that they do to take care of you? And then you start finding all these holes and then the wall just keeps coming down. We had a conversion rate of 75% from calls to appointments. It was, it was un, unbelievable. And that's why I believe so much in the book. I, I read a lot of books, but very few make an, a direct, immediate impact the way, the way yours did. Just cu curious, um, all right, so you got to a conversion rate of 75%. What, what roughly were you doing before that? Oh, probably we would get maybe one out of maybe every six, seven, eight calls. Maybe we'd get an appointment. Wow. And then those appointments had to show up. The, the fact was not only were we at a 75% conversion rate, but the, the bond that we had created with those people during that phone call was so good that they actually showed up for the appointment versus, and it, I don't even have questions about the yeses, but we, you know, you talk about in your book, the three types of yeses that we get, uh, that we typically get. Um, and so by spending 10 minutes on the phone with them, we, we actually get the approval action-based yes that moves the, the ball forward, not just something to get us off the phone. Interesting. I guarantee you there are very few people who or using proof of life questions. There are very few people who are using no oriented questions. And there are tons of people who are enamored with yes. And we'll talk about why that's problematic. Um, I often get asked, how did you get hostage takers to say yes to you? And the answer was, we never did. 
yes is a useless word. It does you no good. It's one of the it's one of the hurdles that you're going to have to navigate in order for you to improve the way you communicate between people. There's this nonsense out there called yes momentum in, in academia. They call it mere agreement, which, which suggests that you're likely to get an agreement to a big ask if there have been micro agreements previous to the ask. Example, uh, do you like clean water? Do you think people who abuse animals should be held to higher account? Do you think the women's national team should get paid as much as the men's national team? Buy my product. The yeses that precede the big ask, they say, doesn't even have to be related to the ask itself. Some people refer to it as the yesable proposition or my favorite, the yes tie down. Think about that for a second. Someone is trying to use yes to tie you down and you like that? Or, or the other side of the coin, you're using yes to tie someone else down and, and you like that? Yes is commitment. Yes encroaches, this, encroaches on autonomy. Yes makes people defensive. Their anxiety goes up. Um, people will cite studies where yesable propositions, mere agreement, yes momentum work. And I'm not here to say that it doesn't work. I'm just here to say if you're using it, your batting average is not as high as it should be. Yes is a lure. It's a hack. It's seductive. We know how good it sounds. And in that moment, we fail to recognize that we have put the other side on the defensive. So we got to get out of the habit. Think about it like this. How do you feel when the phone rings and the person on the other side, I don't care if they're close to you or not. They ask you, do you have a few minutes to talk? Most of you don't think to yourselves, oh my God, yes, I do have a few minutes. I'm glad you called. Four things usually run, uh, uh, run through your brain almost simultaneously. First, how long is a few minutes? Second, if I have a few minutes to talk, do I want to talk to you? Third, if I want to talk to you, do I want to talk about what you want to talk about? And fourth, how can I get off the phone? We have been hammered with yes. Yes, we know, we feel it instinctively when people are trying to drive us somewhere, when people are trying to commit us to something, and we resent it. We don't like committing to something that we haven't volunteered for. And so instead of a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, it's usually set up for a trap. We love to hear it so much, but in that instance, we should know that we're putting the other side on the defensive. Talk about the phases of no. Um, we call this letting no out slowly. So when you're trying, when somebody's trying to get you to do something or trying to get you to, to, to buy something or whatever they're trying to get you to do and you want to say no, you don't necessarily want to go along with it, um, there are different phases of no that you can use. Now, anyone who has read the book knows the line, how am I supposed to do that? You need to be extremely careful 
with how am I supposed to do that? People throw that line around like it's God's answer to everything, and it really isn't unless you're using it appropriately, okay? When you say, how am I supposed to do that? It is basically an assertion when it doesn't have the precursor of empathy. In other words, if you've not used empathy, if you've not tried to get that tactical empathy all the way through your conversation, if you come out with a, how am I supposed to do that? It's going to come across as assertive. Because what you're trying to do when you say, how am I supposed to do that? Is you're trying to trigger empathy in the other side. So if you say it like this, how am I supposed to do that? Am I going to trigger empathy with that tone of voice? No. Okay. So how you want to say this, how am I supposed to do that? Or how am I supposed to do that? Wherever you want to put the inflection, but it's like a thoughtful, seriously, I need you to tell me how am I supposed to do that? Okay. But you, people are not going to care to help you with implementation things and how you're supposed to do that if you've not been using empathy with them all the way through the conversation because they don't feel any empathy toward you. Because remember, if you've used tactical empathy and you've sought to the other, understand the other side, when the time comes, they will seek to understand you. They will use a little bit of that reciprocity, we hope. Most personality types will. And they will try to understand you. And when you put that out there like that, with that implementation question, if you're using the right amount of tactical empathy, they will tr it'll trigger in them. Okay, and you can work with that. So, how am I supposed to do that? That's the first way of saying no. If you say it wrong, they may come back with, I don't know, that's your problem, figure out. I'm not, not my job to do that. If you've not used the appropriate amount of empathy before you try to make that, it's going to come across as an assertion, and that's the response you're going to get. Okay. How am I supposed to do that? You want a, a, an answer from them that's going to give you some information about how, really how you're supposed to do that. They might give you some kind of an explanation. If you're still feeling like you want to say no, you can say, you know, I'm sorry, your, your, your offer is, is very generous. I just don't know how I can do that. Talking goes on a little bit more. You're still not liking what they're offering. You're going to say, I'm sorry, that just isn't going to work for me. And then when they get down to that last one, you're going to say, mm, no. Basically, by doing all of those things, if you know you want to say no to somebody, but you want to protect the relationship for further down the road in case you want to actually do business with these people again, letting no out slowly is the best way to do it. It's like a thoughtful, I've really thought about this. and Oh my gosh, it kills me, but I'm just, I'm not going to be able to do business with you. Letting no out slowly with those four steps like that before you get to that final no, um, is going to save the relationship with the business or whoever the person that you're working with. First things first, the yes momentum. If you've read the book, and I'm sure pretty much all of you have, and probably multiple times, we don't like yes. If you've learned the yes momentum or mere agreement, I imagine you probably got a problem with some of the things that I'm saying now and will say. But what are the problems with yes? The reality is we stay away from yes because there are inherent problems with yes. The reality is people feel tied down when they are required to answer with a yes. The other part about this, the myth of getting people to say yes to a bunch of little things so that they'll say yes to the big thing is in fact a myth. Do you want to make more money? Uh, do you wish you had more time? Do you wish you could go out because, you know, the, the pandemic's getting in the way? Do you want to give me $10 million? Doesn't actually work that way. And the other thing about trying to get people to say yes is it unfortunately shows a serious lack in emotional intelligence. Because at face value, yes is going to make people nervous. And if you're forcing people into a place where you know they're going to feel nervous, the emotional intelligence is lacking. So we stay away from this altogether. We, we look at this as basically it's a bear trap at the end of that rainbow if you're on the yes path. And so what's our alternative? Our alternative is no oriented questions. All of you that, that have read the book have seen this. You have some feel for it. And so real quick, I'm going to share a short story with you. Some of you may have even heard this on Chris's keynotes about dealing with Jack Welsh. So, Jack's in L.A. several years ago. While Chris is living in the area, 
he and I at the time were actually teaching a negotiation course at the Marshall School of Business at USC for the, uh, the graduate program. He goes to a book signing to see Jack. Oh, and if you don't know who Jack Welch is, obviously he's an author. We're talking about Chris going to a book signing to get an author from him. But he was a huge businessman. He's not with us anymore, but he ran GE in the 80s and 90s, turned it into one of the fastest growing companies in the United States. He was actually named manager of the century in 1999, which I don't know if there's a higher accolade than that. And he, he developed this rank and yank system at GE and, and was also adopted in many other places in the corporate world, which essentially means you don't hit certain standards, you're gone. There is no second chance. You got a standard to meet. You don't get there. We're going to roll you out and bring in somebody that can't get the job done. So very big guy, philanthropist, author, a lot of people look up to him and, and, and follow his doctrines as a businessman, even still today. So Chris is at this signing. He wants to see if Jack will come teach at his class at USC. Now, if you know anything about book signings, you got about five seconds with the author. Security's job is to keep people moving through. Chris doesn't have time to have a full conversation with Jack. Do an accusations audit, to do a summary, label and mirror his responses. He doesn't have time to do any of that. He's got he's to do a quick hitter, and he's got to be emotionally intelligent, and he's got to do it now. And so he walks up to Jack, and if you've heard the story, you know that he says, is it ridiculous for you to come speak at my class at USC? And as the story goes, Jack gets a very intense look on his face, looks up and to the left and just kind of freezes with this very angry look. In that moment, Chris thinks to himself, I just killed Jack Welsh. He's an old guy, and he's so angry at my question that he's actually having a stroke in front of me, and he's going to drop dead, and security's going to drag me out of here by my ankles, and I'm going to jail. And after about 10 seconds of this intense look, Jack looks back at Chris, and he says, here's a Twitter handle that's private that only people use internally in my company. My assistant actually runs this as me. I'm going to let her know that you're going to reach out to her through this Twitter handle so that we can keep in touch. And I think we're supposed to be back in LA in the fall. This is sometime in the spring of that year. He says, if we're back in LA at that time frame, I will come speak at your class at USC. Now, the long of it is, Jack wasn't in fact back in the fall, very busy guy, couldn't make it, so it didn't happen. However, he got the commitment in the moment. Why is that? Obviously, the no oriented question. But what happened? What happened in Jack Welsh's brain in that moment that made it so easy for him to answer? And the crazy thing about no oriented questions, and I wish we could point to a specific brain science study that lays this out. Maybe there will be soon, right? With fMRI machines and this wonderful technology and being able to plug electrodes into people's brains, I'm sure there'll be a study at some point that explains how this works what we've observed as negotiators, as content experts, as former hostage and crisis negotiators. When you allow someone to say no to you, and in fact, when you aim at someone saying no to you, it clears their thought process. As a lot of you have thrown into the chat, some of the problems with yes, because yes makes people nervous, the instant reaction is, how do I defend myself in this moment? And that clutters up the brain. It doesn't allow us to be cognitively flexible when we're worried about how we have to defend ourselves. And so he confronted Jack over a very specific want, did it without a confrontational reaction, and cleared Jack's thought process to lay out the implementation of how it would work all at the same time with a very simple question. And so you can take our word for it, or you can do what we're gonna implore you to do as a result of this class and our next two. Go out and start executing this stuff if you're not already. If you are executing this stuff already, then you should start developing your go-to list. 
If you've listened to anything we've talked about before, you know we talk a lot about go-to labels. The reality is, when the heat is on, you fall to your highest level of preparation. And as a result of that, we like to have go-to lists of every single skill that we talk about. And we keep that stuff near to us, right? Laminate it, put it in your jacket pocket, make a list, put it on your desk. We even had a, a good client and now friend of ours sent us a picture of his office. And he had what we would refer to as situation boards set up in different frames all over his office that had lists of skills that he executes on a daily basis in his negotiations. So it's going to help you to have a cheat sheet. Cheat sheet never get beat. That's what we like to say. And so that should apply to the Norrington questions as well. As you can see on the slide here, on the left, we have our classic yes questions. On the right, we have our classic versions of how to begin a no into questions. Would it be impossible? Is it a bad idea? Am I out of line? Is it, would it be out of the question? And so what I'm gonna ask from you now, here's a chance to get some more coaching from Sandy. This slide is, an, is, is a more extensive list of classic yes questions that everybody asks. I'm guilty of asking them in the past. People on our team are even guilty of asking these things in the past. And so pick one or two of the questions off this list and please translate it to a no-oriented question in the chat. And the other thing about this, this is actually a fairly decent prep model. Any yes question can easily be translated to a no question. A good way to do it, 10, 15 minutes before you walk into a negotiation, you want to work on your no-oriented questions. Take a piece of paper, draw a line down the center. On the left, add, put the questions that you would normally want to say, have them say yes to. Don't you agree that this is going to help your company? Don't you want to sign this contract? Don't you want to move forward so we don't waste any more time? Whatever. Draw that line, and on the right, just simply put the no-oriented translation of what that is. And that's a really good way to start getting yourself acclimated, starting to develop your go-to list, as it were. And so last thing I want to mention about this, something we highlight in the book, but is not laid out here in the slides, it's simply the ignoring the question that's phrased, are you against? And this, if you're in any sort of sales role, maybe sales isn't necessarily attached to your title, but there is a sales element to what you do. And for all intents and purposes, we're always selling ourselves, right? I mean, we all know that inherently. And so this are you against has actually shown to be a tremendous closer in the sales world or the closing world, right? However you like to look at it. And simply, are you against moving forward? You've gotten all the way through the conversation, the value has been established, the rapport has been established, and you still seem to be at impasse. That's a great question for that moment. And it's yielded tremendous results. And so we wanna offer that to you and allow you to start using it too. So, Please feel free, get your list started, get your go-tos going, and you're gonna find yourself in a much better place. The phases of no, or what we like to refer to as you see down there in the bottom right, letting no out slowly. We've all seen how am I supposed to do that in the book. We do not explicitly lay out what the phases of no are in the book, partially because this wasn't a fully explored skill from all angles when the book was written, right? We had all this great content. We wanted to get it out to the world, and that's what we had. We continued to develop and grow, just like everybody should. And so one of the biggest things we found from people that have read the book is there are varying degrees of outcomes to the response, how am I supposed to do that? For some of you, maybe you're still batting a 1,000. Every time you say, how am I supposed to do that, you get exactly what you want. They, uh, they fix it and you move forward. I'm sure in some cases on the other extreme, you've maybe never had 
the success you thought you'd have with how am I supposed to do that? And you've had varying responses, including they tell you how to do it. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, this is how you do it. You get these people together and you, and you line them up in this way and you do these things and it should take you about a week to accomplish, right? They actually give you an answer on how we're supposed to do that and now you feel stuck. And so, or you're somewhere in the middle, right? You're either on the ends or you're somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. You've already figured this out as we've worked our way through today. Why is that? Because in the book, it doesn't talk about using an accusations audit to deliver your ask. How am I supposed to do that? Is not only an ask, it's an assertive ask. And so it's even more paramount that an accusations audit come before it. In the book, accusations audits were used by Chris before he dropped this line in at the car dealership with the dealer. We just didn't call out the skills specifically. But if you remember the story, he would constantly say things like, you've been so generous. I can't believe how much work you've put into this. You spent a bunch of time with me today. I really appreciate all the effort and, and time you've given me. I can't believe, you know, and, and the car, the car is worth more than what I'm asking for. It's, pro it's probably worth more than what you guys listed it at. How am I supposed to do that? That was the accusations audit. Generosity and time don't seem like negatives. Why does that apply in this case? Because it's based on their perspective. And the negative that we are attacking is if we don't recognize how generous they've been, they're immediately going to start to remove themselves because you have the audacity not to even see how much time I put into this. And that's when it becomes a negative. Their perspective, how can you not see how hard I'm working to get this done? I would consider myself generous to even still be entertaining this interaction with you. And so calling them generous in the accusations audit is actually directly resulting in what the negative that exists is causing what friction is there. And so another part of this that you should be well aware of and another reason we've had varying degrees of success across the board, this is not a sequential move game. How am I supposed to do that should be delivered at least twice, if not three times before you move forward in the conversation. Why is that? Well, first of all, since it's a question, it's also a thought pattern interrupt. And if they got momentum going, Angry or not, doesn't matter. But if they got mental momentum, mental momentum, right, uh, moving forward, chances are the first time you throw a thought pattern interrupt at them, they're not going to be able to process it. Like, they, it literally just won't penetrate the cranium because the wheels are spinning. And so part of the reason to go back to it again is because they're going to hear it differently the second time after the wheels have started to slow down. And then you may need to go three because when they finally do hear it and they give you an answer, it might be, well, because you got to do this because I said so. And you throw it at them a third time to really and emphatically put your foot down on the implication of that is not going to work, with me, work for me. You got to come up with a different, better solution if we're going to continue forward. And that's the intention behind everything that comes on the third delivery without having to actually verbalize it. And then you move through the list. After you've done it three times, then your fourth move is, I'm sorry, I just don't know how I can do that. Fifth is, that's not going to work for me. And finally, your sixth is the flat out no. I will tell you up to this point, we don't actually know anyone that got all the way to no. Does it mean it can't happen? And over the past 12 years, it hasn't yet. But... You know, it's obviously a possibility. And so that's how you sequence it out. Again, tone is going to be important every time you deliver. Emphasis on the I and how am I supposed to do that is one way to deliver it. Late night FM DJ, use an accusations audit before every single delivery. If you put any one of these skills out there completely naked, the chances that it's going to backfire on you in the moment is that much higher.
we get so hung up. Because at the end of the day, what was Chris telling you? Each of the role players, what was he telling you? No, right? He was telling you no. It was in a different form, car in 60 seconds or she dies. But he was telling you no. Anytime somebody tells you no, they're telling you what? What's behind the no? When somebody gives you pushback, when not somebody says do this or else, cut your price, I'm going to a competitor, take this clause out of the contract or we're not gonna sign, change your delivery date, give me a raise or I'm going to another company, what are they really telling you? Now we got a hand back here. Yes, but they're pushing back. Why are they pushing back? What are they telling you with the pushback? No. They don't trust you or they're afraid of something. We get so wrapped around the axle on the demand. I want a car in 60 seconds. What's behind that? What is he telling you? I want to get out of here. Which tells you what? He's afraid of yeah. Which tells you what? He wants to get out, he's afraid. You're on the right track, just take it far. Go deeper, as they say. As Brandon says, go deeper. Hey, Isaac's the one who gives you crap over that, not me. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing a lot of things. Say it again? I say he doesn't have a plan. No, I think, I think you're back here. He wants to live. He wants who said to that? live. Raise your hand. That's it. That's exactly it. There's a motivation behind every pushback, every no. And it usually has to do with trust usually have to, has to do with fear. There's another motive. When, 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 the, when Chechen terrorists marched into that school in 2004 in Beslan, Russia, one of the first two demands on their list was, we want Putin to resign, and we want Russian boots off of Chechen soil. Show of hands, how many think that would ever happen? And so the powers that be said, it's never gonna happen. This is non-negotiable. We can't negotiate this. What are they saying behind that? Russia, Russian boots off of Chechen soil and Putin has to resign. What are they saying behind it? What? Uh, if you he carry it to its- to die for Willing to die, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. He said they're willing to die for it. If you carry it to its logical extension based on their history, probably. But what is the message behind? They want freedom. Yeah. Their sovereignty and freedom has been encroached upon. That's what we're going to talk about. The fact that they said, take it out of the contract or we're not going to sign, I don't care about that. I want to know what makes them say that. Why are they afraid to sign? What is their environment looks like that's clouding their vision? And so, don't get hung up on the fact that they've issued a threat or they've issued a demand. You take it, you process it, and then you start to attack what's propping that up, what's supporting it. And at the primal level, it's fear or it's mistrust. Did you want to add? Brandon. All right, very good. And yeah, just to kind of add to more of that, how do you get to the why without asking the why? Short answer is labels. And then to go even further than that, labeling the underlying dynamic. I need a car in 60 seconds or she dies. Sounds like you want to live. Circum uh, situation, the circumstance and the situation drive your strategy. When people are barricaded suspects, are they always looking to make it out alive? No. So the fact that they're asking for a car and a way of escape at the beginning is a really good sign. Part of the why that that tells you right away is they want to live. And then how do we get to more of the why? Sounds like you got a reason for doing this. Sounds like you got a good reason, a good justified reason for why you got up this morning and decided to take all these people hostage. What, what, what he said was, and this would be on your go-to labels list, especially as a last ditch effort, it sounds like there's nothing I can say to change your mind. And again, uh, mastery's in tonality, but also to his point, as business people, part of our job is qualifying our clients. And so if you know that you're with somebody that is taking that line with you, the other question you should be asking yourself is, do I want to do business with this schmuck for the next five years? 
Or is it actually easier for me to cut my losses and focus my time on something else? That's one of the great things. That's one of the great things about having autonomy as a business person. You get to make that decision. And so if you know you're dealing with someone who is stuck on that one-track mind, you can take the route of, all right, we'll come to an agreement. I don't mind playing the game as long as I know what the rules are. Or you can say, yeah, this is a fucking waste of my time. I've been working with this guy. He's, he clearly seems to recognize some sort of loss, but he's stuck. His pride and ego is too stuck to this number, and he just doesn't have the ability to think this through right now, which happens. Because that sounds like you're dealing with an assertive, and assertives are one-track mind people sometimes. They get tunnel vision because they're so focused on a goal, and there ain't nothing that's going to penetrate that thought process until they got a couple of nights to sleep on it. And so, how are you, man again, emotional moments, right? How are you managing it? And then do you want to do business with that person?